a virtual world for a virtual mind. If you wanted to create consciousness right now, you'd have to find a partner, initiate freakiness, wait nine months, and there you'd have it. Consciousness. Life. A sentient being of your very creation, born of flesh and blood. But is this the only way to create a mind? If sentient life is made from carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and sweet, delicious phosphorus, why can't it be made from silicon? Is reproduction of consciousness an exclusively biological process, or can it be technological? Furthermore, must consciousness always be linked to a physical entity, or could we create a form of consciousness that was 100% completely virtual? Number four, our problem. Before mankind attempts to create a form of artificial consciousness, we must first accept that we have a problem. Not a drinking problem or a touching strangers on the subway problem, a consciousness problem. We ascribe consciousness solely to organic matter, refusing to believe that something can be conscious unless it is a biological entity created from another biological entity. But life itself was once formed from ordinary, non-sentient matter. At one point, there were planets, stars, and balls of hot gas with nothing of a personality to speak of, from which life somehow began. We do not know how life came to form, and nor do we understand how consciousness exists at all. Therefore, it makes sense that we have this mental block when it comes to non-biological entities possessing consciousness. This would change if we were able to create consciousness artificially, but first we must understand more about it. To model consciousness requires more than mimicking the human ability to detect and analyze signals. Our mind prioritizes certain sensory experiences in ways we do not understand. Our brain guides us towards certain choices. To replicate artificial consciousness, an artificially aware being must do all of this and have the potential for more. Another mental hurdle is that we see limitations in our own creations. If we were to make an artificially conscious being like ourselves, we'd question its authenticity no matter how complex it was. We'd assume we've missed the one crucial thing that makes us humans special, what some might call a soul. But what if we accept that we aren't special? What if there are limitations on our own conscious experiences too? If we hold virtual consciousness to a higher standard than ourselves, it will never seem believable. So, what's the solution? Stefan Sarkardi of King's College London believes he has the answer. We level the playing field. Sarkardi thinks that believable and potentially authentic artificial consciousness can be created, so long as it inhabits an equally artificial world. Number 3. A Virtual Environment In his paper, Artificial Consciousness in an Artificial World, Sarkati suggests we must create and inhabit complex and immersive virtual environments if we wish to also create and engage with artificially conscious beings. And to give his idea some context, he cites an example you'll all be familiar with. Grand Theft Auto Sarkati notes that GTA is an open-world game with its low degree of limitation allowing you to perform a wide range of tasks, including driving, maiming, and driving while maiming. This is in contrast to a robot with a body made of physical materials, whose design and hardware dictate its sensory and cognitive abilities. Put consciousness in a pre-programmed death robot, and it might go on a killing spree, sure, but it will never feel love. In a virtual world, anything is possible. In GTA, this so-called open world is limited by the length of its code and the size of its pixels. As you increase the complexity of both, you can make it resemble the real world ever more. If you drop your pixel size to the level of atoms and program them to react as they do in reality, the framework of your virtual world is now much closer to the framework which exists in the real world, which gave birth to consciousness. Theoretically, from this virtual representation of our world, consciousness may form artificially. If it doesn't, 
we've got some work to do. Number 2. Accidental Creation The creation of consciousness may not involve direct creation, but rather the forming of the ingredients needed for consciousness to create itself. It's like making a loaf of bread. Our virtual world might have flour, salt, butter, and water, but it's only when we add the yeast that consciousness rises. The bread analogy makes the process of creating consciousness sound simple, but it's not. The costs and resources involved in building virtual worlds and minds are and will always be tremendous. Not only must you analyze and recreate every aspect of our world, but you must also continuously monitor this environment to ensure it's working as it should. If the Matrix had shown you the admin side of things, those movies would have been decades long with no time for Kung Fu. Because of these limitations, the virtual environments and beings we create today are nowhere near conscious, and nor can they fool us either. Video games have draw distances and invisible walls. Siri and Alexa respond only to our commands and show no sign of emotion. Our characters in The Sims happily allow themselves to be guided into a doorless room of fire and corpses because they have no goals or desire for self-preservation. True virtual consciousness must have all this and more. It must engage in the same physical and emotional process as we do and for the same reason as we do too. True virtual worlds must also seem limitless in many ways to achieve the same feeling. Because if we can achieve this level of responsiveness, then interactions with conscious beings of our own creation may finally become believable. Number 1. Interaction Interaction is key. It's how we know our fellow humans are aware. It is how we know we are alive. And it helps us form an idea of what our consciousness consists of. Earlier, we mentioned the stimuli which make us aware of our surroundings. But Stefan Sarkati expands on this by explaining how processes such as sweating, crying, and laughing are involuntary responses processed by our brain subconsciously. An artificial consciousness must therefore be equally unaware of how these responses come about, says Sarkati, or we won't believe that they come from a real place. Sarkati goes on to explain how it is the evolution of the brain's cognitive framework which is responsible for this subconsciously driven behavior in humans. Our efficient brains do not waste processing power on letting you contemplate initiating such menial tasks as crying and laughing. It just gets on with it. Sarkati believes this is why we find it unnatural to assign the label of consciousness to robots. They haven't evolved to act as we have. They've been programmed to do it. This is why Sarkati believes that to remove this mental barrier, we too must become virtual. If we are ever to create and engage with artificially conscious virtual beings, humans must first allow ourselves to inhabit an artificial avatar in a virtual world. But how would this work? And what are some of the potential pitfalls of creating a believable form of artificial consciousness? We're going to explore this in our bonus video, Why We're Already in Love with Artificial Beings, which you can watch in our Patreon page at patreon.com slash strange mysteries. For a $2 a month pledge, which you can cancel at any time, you'll get to watch this and all of our bonus content, which goes deeper and darker into every topic than YouTube allows. If you don't want to donate, then that's fine. Bullsh**. We know you wanted more. Strange mysteries on YouTube and our Patreon bonus videos weren't enough to quench your search for truth. To give you that sense of awe and wonder again. To go past what you thought was the end. To give you the answers you seek, but which only lead to more questions. That's why we just up the stakes. Chemicals of reality. Reality. Consciousness. Brains. What else is there? Ask yourself that question. Perhaps that's all there really is, but perhaps everything else is found within a place where these ideas, these things, overlap. Some thing, some place that is undefinable. To many people, altering certain chemicals in their brains produces what they would simply call hallucinations. 
In fact, what we're going to discuss specifically used to be called the businessman's trip, as one could enjoy it. Come down and put your pants back on in the time it takes to eat lunch. It wasn't taken seriously. Well, unless, of course, you started digging. And some people, including us, did. Already, though, to many people, this chemical is special amongst others. Very special. To them, it represents something more meaningful and incredible, as if it's the gateway to the next level of consciousness. The ticket to a higher reality barely explored by most humans. It is the entry point to a new reality visited by only a select few whose minds have become enlightened through the use of this exotic substance. For this reason, it's commonly referred to as the spirit molecule. But is its reputation as a mystical mind opener deserved? Or is it and everything it represents just a load of bullshit? We look at, investigate, and dive deeply into nearly all available research regarding this question from nearly every angle feasible. And in the course of doing so, stumble upon unexplainable patterns, correlations, and neurological evidence for a reality existing beyond this one. Watch this hour-long Strange Mysteries premium video, Chemicals of Reality, as well as many more to come by becoming an elite premium member of our Patreon at patreon.com slash strange mysteries.